Let's welcome in Jim Barnett. Hey, Jim, how you doing? Matt, nice to hear from you. Yeah, nice to talk to you, too. Uh, you know, circumstances aren't great, but I, I got to believe, you know, you were you were at Oregon a little bit before Bill at UCLA, and you were in Portland a little bit before him in Portland. Uh, you were colleagues as announcers. I mean, just uh, I know you had a relationship with him, and, and what, you know, just give us your thoughts on Bill Walton. Well, I, I knew him. I first met him when he was a junior in high school at Helix High School in San Diego. It's actually a little, uh, uh, a little suburb called La Mesa, and I lived out there because uh, I played for the San Diego Rockets for three years after my initial rookie season in Boston. I was a San Diego Rocket. It was an expansion team in 1967. And so I got to know Bill because he, he went to Helix High, which is one of the, right in my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And uh, we used to work out at his high school with him when he was in high school. The San Diego oh. Rockets with Pat Riley, myself, Don Cogis, Elvin Hayes. And he had the key to the gym, uh, his high school gym at Helix High School. And we used to go over there in the summertime and off season and work out with him. And he could, he, let me tell you, he could keep, he could keep right in rhythm with us. Wow. Jim, let me ask you this, cause I still miss you on the broadcast and you know what it takes to be entertaining. And when I heard Bill Walton behind the mic, just talk the game of basketball, it, it, it was like Picasso. How shocked were you that he was able to do it in a way that, it, it was just him being himself, and it captivated a lot of people. Did you ever say to yourself, I didn't know he had it. I, I didn't know he had that in him? Well, it, certainly, because he was very quiet uh, in school because he had uh, a speech impediment, and he stuttered. And he, he, <laughs> I read somewhere where he said, English is my fourth language behind stumbling, stammering, and bumbling. <laughs> and so he, he didn't talk a lot because he had a very difficult time enunciating, but he overcame that um, to become, in fact, I think, I, I've read different things through the years um, when he was on television, in particular doing college games, and he'd go off on tangents, and he would <laughs> and, and, and he would forget about the game, and he'd go into, but, you know, he was, a, he was a very smart, very intelligent man, well-read, and he, he just knew a lot of things, and high IQ, and and all the stuff he'd be talking about, he might be talking about events in World War II or something that have nothing to relate to the game that they're doing, particularly the college games. And he'd go off on tangents like that. He was his own man. Um, you know, the, the last time I saw him was a few years ago after the broadcaster um, died up in Portland, Oregon. And um, Bill Shonley. We were, we were Paul Bears. We were Paul Bears at the funeral. Yeah. Um, and so um, I think that's the last time I saw him a few years ago up in Portland, Oregon. Um, but, you know, he, he was a great player. He was a MVP in the league. Uh, but he never played more than 65 games in a season because he was injured all the time. And if you look at his stats, his, his, his scoring and everything and total number of points is way down uh, because, hell, he missed uh, four complete seasons. In fact, um, in 78 and 79, in the early 80s, uh, he never played at all. And the most games he ever played in Portland, which was at the peak of his career, of course, uh, were 75 games. So um, he, he was a different guy. Um, I got to know him very well. You know, I, I knew him in high school. when He was in high school, and I was a San Diego Rocket. But I got to know him later on. Um, as I say, we were pallbearers at, at the funeral for Bill Shonley, the long time, I think 28 to 29, 30 years, uh, broadcaster for the Portland Blazers. And he and, um, I and four other former Blazers were the pallbearers. Um, so that was an honor to, to, that was really one of the last times I ever had close contact with him, uh, just a few years ago, uh, when Bill died when he was 83 or 93 years old. So, um, there was no, no, I tell you what, he was the consummate team basketball player. Mm. He was such a great passer. He was such a great passer. He was sometimes on a, on a, one of his teammates would cut to the basket and he'd be open for a layup, but he's not looking at the ball and Bill would throw the ball purposely off his back <laughs> and they'd go retrieve it. And so people learned that he was such a great passer. When they cut to the basket and they were going to be open, 
they're going to get the ball from Bill Walton because he was a very, very unselfish player. He was the, the, the consummate team basketball player. That's who he was. Yeah, Jim Barnett joining us on 95-7, the game. We're talking about the late Bill Walton, who passed yesterday uh, at 71. Uh, Jim, the, when Portland won the title in 77, um, I know you were on that Sixers team earlier in the year. And yes. that that finals, I, I remember because it, it was considered it, it, a huge upset because the, the Sixers had McGinnis and Irving and they had what people yeah. called an all-star team. And Portland was was just the quintessential team, and it was it was it was kind of the perfect uh, team beating a group of individuals, and yeah. you know that's the way that one was built. Yes, and uh, that's kind of a maybe the lowest part uh, in the history of my experience in the NBA because I had been let go by the New York Knicks earlier that. Uh, season or actually yeah earlier mm-hmm. in that season during training camp um and what happened is i came home because we we'd uh, just had a child our first child and jennifer was born and i went back somehow D- doug collins got hurt uh, for philadelphia and this was uh 77 there and they called me and they signed me to a contract and I went back and played for the Sixers. I was on that Sixers team, but I did not play in the finals because I really, it, as I say, it was, it's the low point and decision I ever made. I got very homesick. We had just had our daughter. She had some physical problems, was in the hospital. I was very concerned about her and I left the team. I left the team just prior to the finals. And as it turned out, an injury, I, I was put on injury reserve anyway at the time. And so I didn't think I was going to play, but I, I'm, I'm trying to think somebody got hurt. It might've been Doug Collins, in fact, and I would have played in the NBA finals in that, in that series, but I was home and I, and I missed that. And it's one of the, the, the biggest regrets I ever had, but I also, you know, I had to get home for personal reasons. And so um, I'm very aware of that, all, all that whole championship series uh, between the two teams. Jim, I, I'm just hearing you, you talk about Bill as a team player, and I'm thinking, you know, as I'm growing up and I'm watching him with the Celtics just rooting on, you know, Larry Bird and the, and the rest of the gang, he was a team player. He loved life, he loved people, and he loved ball. And I kind of wish he could see the impact and effect that he had on people, you know, all the outpour of emotion and, and the impact he had on people's lives. I just want to share with you, being behind the microphone, and his NBA career being shortened, Jim, he never once sounded bitter. And I've met and no. I've been around bitter people, but does that just speak to the man that he was? Did he still, when you heard him, love the game? Guru, you're exactly right. He had an infectious personality, and I can, it almost brings me to tears thinking about him right now because whenever I would see him later in life, he would light up and... And he, he treated me like I was one of the previous, you know, great, one of the greatest players in the NBA and the history of the NBA. That's how he illuminated with me, Jim Barnett. And he went on and on and on. And he made you feel so good. Um, the, he just was so positive. And I'll never forget the way he reacted whenever I came across him. And of course, we go back to his high school days. And so we had a lot of history, but he, he just was so generous and his compliments all the time, and he made you feel like a million bucks. He really did. He made you feel like an NBA all-star that I'd been an all-star for, you know, uh, 10 or 12 years, and that's the way he was. Um, He was so upbeat, and I think he was just, you know, he had so many injuries. He he had, I don't know, what was it, 35 to 40 surgeries in his feet and his ankles and finally his spine, and he, he was put together, he was, you know, mechanical, and he could hardly walk later on. He, in fact, sometimes he later on in life, he would be so such pain that he had to crawl back, back to his house a little bit on his steps. And it, it's, it's, um, he just, you know, he had the good and the bad, but he was a consummate team basketball player. And of course with John Wooden and, and those years. And when they, he was in the midst of that run where they had 
nine titles in 10 years, something that'll never be duplicated when John Wooden was coaching at UCLA. Um, so he, he was one of a kind and he died way too young, age 71. We know that, but he was in a lot of pain. I know he's not in pain now. Yeah. Uh, Jim, one, one last one uh, for you, because I, you know, when he got out of UCLA and was in Portland, he had a lot of injuries and, you know, he, he wasn't always this gregarious, loved um, person. No. You know, he was very quiet. And, 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 like, can you speak to his early days in Portland? Because it, it seemed like there was well, acrimony was, toward him because he, he, couldn't get on the, he couldn't get on the floor. Yeah. In, in fact, uh, his MVP year in 77-78, he only played 58 games, but he's still an right. <laughs> NBA right. MVP. But part of it is he was an activist and he was outspoken and he was a a, a champion for racial inequality. And that's why he had so many great black friends uh, because he always felt he'd done them wrong. And he was kind of a hippie type guy. You know, he, he was, he got involved with the, you know, the, in, in a way, you know, with, with Jack and Mickey Scott who were, part of the Patty Hearst Symbionese oh, Liberation right. Army, if I remember. Yeah. And so he was, he was, you know, he, he later on, you know, divested his interest and all in that and, and disclaimed it all, but he was an activist. And so sometimes he got a little confused. And so, um, I, I think he might've even, he knew Jack and Mickey Scott and, and they were very active and wanted by the, you know, federal authorities. Right. Um, and, and he actually, I'm not sure he might've lived with them for a, a short time or something, but he, he, he could, he could be very extreme at yeah. <laughs> one to the other, but I, he finally got all straightened out except for his health. And, um, you know, he could barely walk when he was, you know, in his last few years of life. And it was very, very tough to see him like that. Um, but I, I just remember him as that. 16 and 17 year old kid at Helix High School and the San Diego Rockets used to use his gym to work out with him and he could he could keep pace with us right there. Wow. Um, it was unbelievable and so I knew him when he was a kid and I've always loved him. Yeah, wow. Jim, wow. thank Good you stuff. so much you. for uh, sharing about, about Bill. Really appreciate it and uh, glad to hear you're doing well. Thank you, Matt. All right, Guru. All, All right, right, take it easy.